welcome to Chapter 12, Work and the Economy. Let's get started by talking about the three major economic systems prevalent in the world today, starting with, of course, capitalism, our very own economic system here in the United States for the most part. Capitalism is defined as the means of production lie in private hands, which means individual citizens can uh, be in charge of the means of production rather than having any government oversight. Uh, capitalism's main pursuit is that of profit, and there is little to no government intervention in the economy. As opposed to socialism, where the means of production is in collective hands or in a large group of people, in this case, notably the government, and the pursuit is not uh, for individual profit or gain, the pursuit is the collective good and the betterment of society as a whole. And in socialism, the government is in control of the, the economy. There is a third option called democratic socialism, which you've probably heard a lot about recently uh, with the presidential elections of the last couple cycles. Democratic socialism ideally is the best of both capitalism and socialism. The means of production is both private and collective meaning that uh, much of the means of production lie in private hands, uh, but the government also uh, has some role here and controls certain industries. The pursuit is both profit at the individual level as well as an eye on the collective good. And with democratic socialism, there is some government intervention to uh, provide controls and regulations in the economy but allowing individual citizens um, a, a wide range of political freedom. And you can see from your textbook, there is not a lot of purely capitalist societies, although there are a few, uh, notably here in North America, up in Canada, over in Australia, um, parts of England, uh, if you can see that there. Um, uh, and there's a fair amount that are mostly free market, which is uh, what the United States is considered. Uh, you can see that uh, the United States is not really a capitalist society, meaning that we do have uh, a lot of government intervention in our economy. And there is a lot of government regulation that um, keeps our economy uh, running as best as it can. Let's now look at some sociological perspectives or our three sociological perspectives on work and the economy, starting with structural functionalism. And as you recall, structural functionalists are always looking at trying to answer the question, what are the functions of whatever we're talking about? So in this case, it would be what are the functions of work and the economy to a functionalist? Uh, work in the economy provides goods and services that we all need to exist and to have a good life. Uh, work, of course, provides income that we need to purchase the goods and services. But even beyond income and money and uh, providing the necessities of life, uh, work, according to the functionalist, also helps to provide us a sense of identity and uh, increase our self-esteem as we engage in numerous hours of work per week. Uh, we become, quote, productive members of society. And part of work is wrapped up in our identity, whether we be a nurse or a firefighter, or a teacher, or a politician, or a judge, or a lawyer, or a construction worker. These things become part of who we are and how we see ourselves. Work also provides social connections. Uh, we spend a lot of time at work, and we meet a lot of people at work. And oftentimes we provide, uh, or we um, engage in, and create social networks and um, social connections for ourselves. The conflict theory, of course, is always looking at who has the power in any particular interaction and who might be in conflict. So for the conflict theories, uh, theorists, they look at work in the economy as largely this macro level conflict between the bourgeoisie or the owners of the means of production, management, if you will, versus the proletariat or the workers, uh, the, the day laborers, the laborers who keep the uh, companies and factories uh, working. And of course, from the conflict perspective, 
this is how we came to be to have all the workers rights that we enjoy today such as the 40, 40 hour work week overpay sick time vacation uh, you know health insurance retirement funds, social security, all of these things, according to the conflict theorists, came about as a result of this ongoing conflict between management and their workers. The symbolic interactionists, of course, are looking at this from a micro level, and they're looking at how we interact with each other at work and how we derive meaning from these interactions. Symbolic interactionists believe that workplaces provide rich environments for human interaction at the micro level. Uh, workplaces are full of symbolism, whether it be gender, uh, power relations, the norms and values that we abide by in a workplace. And uh, meaning is gained about human behavior through our interactions at work, whether it be white collar positions, blue collar positions, um, the place uh, that the interactions are taking place in with, such as a hospital or a farm, a retail environment. Uh, symbolic interactionists are looking at how we interact with each other in these environments and of course the symbols that we use to better understand those human interactions. So this brings us to our code words for chapter 7 and the code words are honest day's work. Make a note of that and enter that into Canvas. And we'll turn our attention to the problems that are associated uh, in our workplaces and within the economy itself. Let's first talk about unions. Unions in the early 20th century were a big part of our economy and the workplace. Um, about over the last 40 years, union membership has declined, however, from a high of 25% of all non-agricultural workers to about as low as 7% today. The benefits of unions, of course, are what we call the union wage premium, meaning union uh, wage workers generally earn significantly higher wages than non-union workers in the same position. Um, people of color tend to have higher uh, rates of union representation. So having strong unions in our culture and in the economy tend to help people of color at uh, higher rates. And within union membership uh, comes higher rates of health insurance. We know that people in unions tend to have higher rates of insurance, better insurance, lower co-pays than those who are without uh, union membership. So as our union membership declines in society, we see also a decline in wages. We see um, uh, higher uh, deficits for people of color as a result to, uh, of lack of union jobs and higher rates of non-insured people as we um, experience lower rates of union membership. Unemployment, of course, is, is always an issue in the economy. Uh, we know that black and Latino workers tend to have higher rates of unemployment regardless of the economic situation than their white counterparts. And there's also the underemployed. These are people who are working at jobs below their qualifications or working at multiple jobs just to make ends meet. So a college graduate, for example, who is working uh, a service job or a minimum wage job at McDonald's or Walmart because they can't find a, a good job in their field. And underemployed also include people who have dropped out of the job market out of frustration uh, of not being able to find a good paying job. The sociological imagination all the way back in chapter one comes into play here, uh, particularly during uh, economic downturns when we see unemployment rates spike. We can look at the sociological imagination to help us understand that this is not necessarily individual failings, um, that this is an economic and systemic failing that is leading to high rates of unemployment. And we can apply our sociological uh, understandings to this uh, at this point to understand how unemployment and employment is impacted by race and ethnicity. There are lots of fascinating studies that your book talks about um, where people of color are denied interviews or job um, uh, offers based on their ethnicity or race, based on the uh, sound of their name or the spelling of their name. Uh, lots of studies to suggest white people, even with criminal backgrounds, 
uh, tend to get hired at higher rates than people of color without criminal backgrounds. So we know that there is a significant um, racial and ethnic bias in our employment system and in our economic system. Uh, this also uh, partly leads to the economic inequality that we've heard a lot about over the last um, several years in which we see higher and higher rates of uh, money and income going to the top one and top 10% of the population in this country, leaving very little for the remainder 80 or 90%. Um, economic inequality at the rates that we're experiencing here in the United States lead to higher levels of poverty overall. Uh, lower levels of economic mobility, meaning it is harder and harder for people to move up into the middle class and from the middle class into the upper classes. And when we have higher rates of economic inequality, unfortunately, we also see slower economic growth because there is less money uh, to go around with the 80% uh, to spend uh, to juice the economy. Uh, we know that the middle class and the lower classes tend to spend more a uh, higher percentage of their income on good, goods and services than the uh, super wealthy who tend to uh, put their money away in investments and banks and stocks and so forth. So economic inequality can be a dangerous and damaging uh, factor in societies. And that's what we have been seeing in the United States for the last several years. So looking at how to address the social problems that come with work and the economy, we know that in capitalism, there are many losers, right? Capitalism is a zero-sum game. Uh, it's all for one and one for all, and this leads to unbridled greed for even greater wealth at the individual level. And uh, corporations are left free to engage in behavior that advances their profits in a capitalist society, but that also often causes other social ills that we've been discussing. Things that we can do as a society to help protect our economic interests and the interests of all workers is to um, protect against racial and ethnic bias so that workers of color and people of color have equal opportunities in the, in the workforce. We can adjust our tax policies to become more fair and to ensure that corporations and the ultra rich are paying a fair share of their income as opposed to the, as compared to the middle and lower classes. We can insist the unemployed during economic crises and make sure they have opportunities and a safety net until they're able to rejoin the workforce. We can look at uh, imposing more government intervention in the economy uh, to safeguard against severe economic downturns and to protect uh, workers' rights. And we can do more to address the issue of corporate crime and white collar crime and tax fraud as discussed uh, in your textbook. That's going to do it for chapter 12.